Please welcome Cluster to the Red Bull Music Academy. Hello. It's nice to hear that applause for, you know, two guys as great as this. And we could speak about their music from a number of perspectives because their music has gone on to influence the tons of music, industrial, you could call a, a minimal synth or... Um, I, I don't know, dark new wave. I mean, tons of music that I've heard over the years seems to spring from the music that these men and uh, some of their peers created. I'm probably most qualified to speak on it from a hip hop perspective, so you guys will have to pardon me as I indulge myself and talk about how I first found their music. Um, in the mid 90s, when those of us that were most intrigued by hip hop were starting to see producers buying records from Germany's 70s scene, uh, the first records that they were finding, of course, were the most well distributed, and those would be the likes of Can. I'm sure many of you have heard of Can. Um, Embryo, Amandul, Kraftwerk, Noi. But of course, there were legendary records that were related to these records, and you know, many of us had heard of them, but this, these were the days of before eBay, so no one was selling these records. You had to be a, probably a guy in your 40s back then with ungodly sums of money and a network of psychedelic record collectors to even have heard of the first press of Cannes' first record, Monster Movie, which came out, as uh, I told him the other day, on Scheiss House. Great label. <laughs> But uh, on one of my first trips to Germany, um, I was lucky enough to have stumbled into a psychedelic record store and see, for the first time, this incredibly packaged, dark-looking record by this band Cluster, then with a K. And these were records, like I said, that you might have heard about, and you know, the net was starting to bring a little more information to all of us that were a bit interested. And well, I saw this record, and it was prohibitively priced, somewhere around $1,000 back then which, if I recall correctly, was about the same price that the guy who was selling it was selling the original press of Monster movie for. So, of course, I had to hear it, you know? I just had to know what it was. It hadn't uh, even crossed my radar. And so this, this is the track. Um, let's see if we can play the track that I heard from the first Cluster album. This was called, the album? Klopfzeichen. Which means? Which means knocking signs when you knock at the door. Let's see if this works. Very quiet music. Yeah, very nice. <laughs> no wonder you guys went on to create ambient music. Uh, <laughs> uh, maybe someone can help me like figure out which channel this is supposed to be on. My DJ days are unfortunately long behind me.
that goes on for like another 20 minutes. And uh, you can obviously hear why I was happy that I didn't have $1,000. I would have had nightmares for years <laughs> had I bought that record and, and listened to it. Um, they, they went on to create a bunch of other music, which we're going to speak about, but that record particularly uh, came back in my life about uh, three years ago when a group from San Diego who I was interested in signing, uh, two kids in their early 20s, played me a song. And uh, like the first album, uh, The Knocking Sound by Cluster, they didn't have any titles for their songs, and I put on the first song. And it was as much of a cover of that as I'd ever heard. And that was very impressive to me because I you know, did realize that there was a new generation after mine that had discovered this band and everything that they stood for. And it uh, just happened that when I was uh, sending some text messages to a producer on the label that I manage, Madlib, and I told him, hey, I'm going to be uh, interviewing Cluster. And he texts me back and he says, that's funny, I was just making a beat with a Cluster record <laughs> <laughs> on Brain, of course, some of their later work. Um, and we only have a limited amount of time here, so we're not going to go through this duo's incredible uh, history. We're just going to go through part of it. But um, I figured that it would be good to start by playing you this so that we could try to put this into a context and build from there, playing some songs uh, from their landmark records that they recorded throughout the 70s. And they've given their tacit approval to this approach, so that's what we'll do. Uh, first, if we could start, um, where were you born? I am born in 1934, in October 1934, before World War II. Where? In Berlin. And uh, by the time that you created this record, were you trained musically? No, I wasn't trained. I was a physiotherapist before, a masseur physiotherapist, before I went over to be an artist in the late 60s. So. By the time you recorded this record, you were in your mid-30s. Yes. And how about you, young man? <laughs> uh, I was in the mid-20s. <laughs> I'm born 44 in Switzerland, but I'm German anyway. Uh, because my parents didn't want to be in Germany at this time. <laughs> right, <laughs> As of course. you can believe. <coughs> So what was the catalyst for forming this group? Uh, was it the two of you, or was there a third person? No, in the beginning there was Konrad Schnitzel, a pupil of Joseph Beuys, a fine artist, very famous in Germany. I don't know whether he is famous here. I think he's famous here as well. Uh, everybody knows about him. Fluxus movement in fine arts was, he was it's the head of it. And uh, Schnitzel was uh, the pupil of him, and he was the one who collected the two of us to be members of the group Cluster with K. This was in Berlin now? It was in Berlin, yes. In the mid-60s? Yes, in the end of 60s, uh, 69, exactly 69. Uh, there was a club, too, that you guys were a part of, uh, an organization, a venue. The venue, uh, we, we built this venue in 68 already, and it went on uh, for about one and a half year. And when it closed, the group Cluster was born. What was the venue called? Zodiac. Zodiac in Berlin. And the guy, uh, Boris, this fine artist, where Schnitzler was uh, a pupil, uh, his um, idea was uh, that anybody can be an artist. So what Schnitzler learned from Boris is everybody can be a musician. So were you a trained musician? Uh, not really. I, I played saxophone, but not very good. And um, my, since my mother was a pianist, so I grew up in a house with lots of music, but more classical music. <coughs> now, one of the things that's often said in, uh, in reviews of your music or in... Uh, kind of third-party treatises on the music that you created, especially at this time, it's that um, you can hear uh, Stockhausen's influence, Karl Heinz Stockhausen. Uh, is this true? I mean, were you influenced by Stockhausen? At all. Not at, at all. all? Not at all. I never heard anything from him until I was uh, 50, perhaps. Really? really? I, I knew his name, but I didn't know his music. I got to know his music when we played on a festival in... Stavanger in um, Norway, where he also played his uh, music. So I, that's the first time I got to know his music. 
So then, if you weren't influenced by Stockhouse, and you must have at least been influenced by people like Pierre Henri, the music concrete movement in France? And the most influence was ourselves. We were influenced by our life, by the way we appreciate living, not really by musicians, by exact, we can't count names. And we listen to, to many people, of course. I listened to Pierre Henri and to Yanis Xenakis at the time, but uh, just um, to know about them, not to copy them or to do that something with what they did. Well, that's, that's an interesting uh, question then, actually. What, what music were you listening to for enjoyment when you were making music like this in 1969? Pop music. Like? Like uh, Third Ear Band, Hebs Hesh and the Colored Coats. I don't know whether anybody knows these groups anymore. And uh, later on, with Jimi Hendrix and... Uh, Velvet Underground. Oh, Velvet Underground, yeah. You were listening to Jimi Hendrix in the Velvet Underground and making music like this? <laughs> of course. <laughs> we tried to imitate them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God you were trained musicians then. Um, also, another thing that's been said is that uh, there's a lot of striking similarities between your music and, and, and free jazz, although I personally don't hear that. Is this a, a fair assessment? Were you listening to any free jazz from the it 60s? Was not free jazz. I, I was listening to guys like John Coltrane, for example, <coughs> and later to groups like, uh, as I told you, Marte Hoople, for example. <laughs> and, and you? Chet Baker, um, this famous guy, Frank Sinatra. <laughs> I liked wow, it at yeah. the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's. No? I think it's really, uh, it's really cool to hear you guys talk about these uh, seeming uh, pop influences, even though a lot of the music that you refer to, of course, had much more of a sensibility than just being pop. Um, because this music, as dark as it is, forces us, 40 years after it was created, to look back and say things like, well, you must have been influenced by the Grupo de Nuova Consonanza in Rome because the techniques were the same and the way that you were recording and the styles are similar. And you're saying that, that you weren't even aware of the group. No, we, we had to find our own tone language. We had to find out whether it really works. We wanted to be musicians. We didn't know anything about music. I mean, a little bit about music theoretically. But uh, in fact, we had to practice Coran Publico, what or wherever we played music, uh, was in the studio as well, to uh, to become aware of uh, the possibilities of the material to handle with it. We had no uh, intellectual approach no. to what we did, so we rehearsed en public. Uh, that's the only places where we played. Really, we were always en route in, in our truck. And always when we could play somewhere with public, that's the only time we played. Our university. So how was this first record recorded then? It was one session in one night. It's only one of the two, two, two records that, that came out. Um, one session. We played a, con a concert from about, uh, of about two hours in a constant flow. Where was this? In Köln with Connie Plank as a sound engineer. C Connie Plank, the, the producer, recording engineer. Yeah. You guys all read the uh, newspaper that was floating around yesterday, right? It was like one man's recollections of working with the legendary producer, right? We don't need to explain who he is. He's the guy who also uh, produced groups like Devo or, uh, of course, Neu and Duff and Kraftwerk and uh, also, for example, that's why how he made money. Um, now I, fo I forgot the name. Black but feet, uh, uh, Black feet. No, 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 an, Ameri uh, an English or American group, super group. Um, I, it's okay. He, he's a very, very uh, well-known producer. So then how did you create a record like that? I mean, did you go in and did you have synthesizers and did you have Moogs and the like? No, we had, uh, we bought the two of us, we had each uh, an organ, electric organ. He had a, a knee violin, I had a cello, 
and all picked up by microphones, but we didn't use it in, as a normal instrument just to create sounds. We had some tone generators. Wah wah pedals. Wah wah pedals, effect, little effect machines. Echo, echo machines. Echo yeah. machines, yeah. We just fiddle around with what we, what we owned at the time. And this was all recorded and manipulated yeah, live. Yeah, all manipul manipulated live, yes. I read somewhere that uh, the way that you knew to stop a recording was when he raised his hand and signaled the end of a side. Is that true? Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, you, you, you mentioned a, a second uh, album that was recorded during this session. With two Easter eggs is what the English title is. Yeah. Play a little bit of that track. Um, I, I believe this is track one on the two Easter eggs record. Als ich mich nach dem Mittagessen hinlegte, kam der Tod. Er legte seine Hände um meinen Hals, stellte mir den Atem ab und sagte, so. He said it's a nice short song. This goes on for another 22 minutes <laughs> like this. Um, you know, d again, you know, not understanding German whatsoever, he could have been talking about anything, you know. He could have been talking about baking bread or the end of the world. It just it sounded terrifying to me. It's a great voice. Yeah, great incredible voice. voice. Yeah. Um, but this kind of leads into the way that these uh, records were, were pressed and released and why they've turned into, you know, grails of sorts that we've all tried to, to seek out because um, they were pressed and released on a very small label that didn't specialize, if you could call it, this kind of music at all. The Schwan label. The Schwan label, it was called New Church Music. New Church Music? Yeah. It was produced by the Catholic Church. <laughs> so I exactly, how did you guys pull this one off? But <laughs> for, for us, it was an opportunity to, to, produce. to have two uh, CD records, records done. Uh, without uh, knowing any companies or record companies. So just the, the Pope just heard this on the radio, yeah. is that how it works? <laughs> <laughs> how did it work? I mean, how did you, how did you get funded by the church? It was, it was a cantor of a church who listened to one of our concerts in Düsseldorf in a basement somewhere, and he said, oh, that's great, great stuff to, to, to put text over it, to put text over it. Oh, okay. Yeah, so the, the, the vocals were from the economic movement. Got it. So the vocals were added after. Yeah, that. afterwards. Okay. Yeah. And only on one side yeah. of the record. Was that a deal that you guys worked out with the church? <laughs> yes, we <laughs> we tried to have it all clean, but <laughs> it was not possible. <laughs> and is is it true that they only made two hundred copies of each record? Yes. Yes. The first edition was two hundred each, but in a beautiful cover. Beautiful, oh, yeah, covers. beautiful covers, both beautiful both, covers yeah. with inserts. I mean, these are very well packaged, well produced, and as you can hear, you know, really good sounding records. And uh, this was just the beginning. I mean, there was a transition period where you uh, split with Schnitzler, right? Yeah. And recorded and released two other very rare albums uh, under the name. What was it? it was it Eruption? No, this was Wissschnitzer, the last album, yeah. the last concert we ever did together as Cluster with K was Eruption, yeah. Eruption because uh, the sound in this, uh, with whom uh, Konrad Schnitzer worked all the time, he and him together, there was the name of their group was Eruption. It was not uh, meant to, to the Cluster group. It's just, just, just the name of the record. And then somehow, in the midst of all this, you managed to get picked up by a major label. How exactly did that happen? Phillips signed you to an oh album deal. Oh, yes, it was They nice. didn't know what they did. 
Well, I mean, they had to have had some idea. I was uh, positing earlier that perhaps the reason they signed you is because, you know, they had been investing a lot of money into an avant-garde series in France that was based around the music concrete movement, and they were making some very well-packaged, rather incredible albums full of, uh, you know, music like, yeah. like this. Um, that was in France, of course. You were assigned to Philips Germany. And uh, so what did your A&R say when you turned in the album? Did you even have an A&R that was oh, working with know. you to develop the sound? I don't know anymore. What is an A&R? This is the like the person who like works with you to develop the, the the project before it's released. Oh no, we didn't have any anybody like that. <laughs> I think it was Connie Plank who managed to do it. Did he have some relations no. with Philips? Is that no. is that how you got signed? No, no. He just recorded with us, but we had to care about selling the. We had to terrify uh, the people in the yeah. company. <laughs> Well, let's hear your first commercial release then to see if we can discern any difference between <laughs> that and which <laughs> came before it. This must have sold tons. <laughs> it didn't. It didn't. <laughs> uh, it's amazing that you were able to get this record out. As I told you, they didn't know what they did because they, they were really in a strange situation because um, they had this one group, Can, I think, that was successful. So they, they wanted to have all the companies in Germany wanted to have one of these progressive groups. So when you are lucky, you, you get a contract, but without a lot of money, of course. And um, that's how it happened to us, that Philips took us for one record. And that's that one, uh, the only one, of course. You mentioned Can. Um, were you guys living in Cologne at the time of yeah. making this record? Near their place, and Holger Chuk, I played to with, uh, with us and on two records with Brian Eno. The later uh, 70s yeah, ones. Uh, but, but in the early 70s, when this record was made, because it's 1971, were you aware of the music that bands like Can and Amandul and Embryo were making? Of course. We were yeah, since we were, we lived all around Germany at this time. We lived in. We, we left Berlin, which was an island at this time, uh, surrounded by the wall and surrounded by East Germany. So we left this little island and went to Düsseldorf near Cologne and then to Munich and Frankfurt and all these uh, West German towns, where we, of course, met also other groups, which were West German groups, uh, like Cannes in Cologne and uh, Kraftwerk in Düsseldorf and Amandul in Munich. And Popol Vuh in Munich as well. <coughs> now this was very uh, rhythmic, beat-heavy music uh, for the most part, yet you guys never had a drummer nor a you know, rhythm guitarist or anything like this. Did you, you feel the pressure to create music that was akin to this, that which had commercial success in your home country? We never were in pressure. We always did what we wanted to do. It just happened. We wanted to be commercial, of course, but <laughs> we were not able to be commercial. <laughs> you mean you wanted to be commercial with this music? <laughs> <laughs> you wanted to change the tastes of uh, an entire world? Yes, <laughs> of course. So that they'd start listening to this. <laughs> but at the same time, uh, you remarked earlier that when you were making records like this, you were listening to Pink Floyd. Yes. But I, at, at, at the same time, I was also listening to... Uh, To whom? <laughs> to, to, it's so long ago. To um, Velvet Underground, but not also to the hoop of the yeah, Velvet but also the later to to Roxy Music, the first mm -hmm. album, which was of course very successful, mm -hmm. and um, 
I went to a concert from them, one of the first in, in Hamburg. Didn't we go together? We together. <coughs> you uh, managed to get signed after, I assume, you were dropped by Philips. For the fir after the first record, mm -hmm. they did an option a second. You said that earlier. So uh, you were signed by Brain Records, then a fledgling enterprise um, based in Hamburg, right? Yes. But they'd managed to get out uh, some really serious releases before the first record you put out, including the first Noia album. How did you manage to get signed by Brain? Uh, perhaps he didn't know what he did. <laughs> <laughs> again, <laughs> again. <laughs> Well, uh, same old story. <coughs> you know, tr truth be told, though, the, um, the Brain label, though it later went on to be, you know, quite a powerful enterprise when it was first releasing records like yours, was still quite small and, and, and very independent minded. So it's not surprising that they would uh, pick you up. I was just curious as to how it happened. There's a track on the first record that you released on Brain called Cluster 2, which is quite well known in the amongst the kind of psychedelic rock community, probably the closest thing to a psych rock jam mm -hmm. that you guys have. Um, let's play it right I'm now. I'm curious, what track do you mean? <laughs> yeah, let's play it. <laughs> ah, yeah. And so on. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, goes on for like another 11 minutes. And believe me, I can listen to a fuzz guitar going through various uh, pedals and effects processors for 11 minutes myself. But um, you know, still, although this is rhythmic music, you know, you guys are making music that could be uh, lumped in with a lot of the music that was being made by your peers. It still is, is lacking uh, in any, you know, drumming. There's no drumming going on. There's no bass player. Oh, we just listened a little bit to a very fast-going drum machine on this uh, track. Now, whose idea was it to bring a drum machine into the music? Did it come from you? Did it come from Connie Plank? No, it came from us. We got the first drum machine, Drummer One, the two of us, and we played with it live all the time. When did you buy it? Oh, I don't know. It was meant to be a drum machine for these guys in in the dancing halls with where you push on one thing and it's foxtrot or the other one is walls. Yeah, tang tango walls, <laughs> yes. Well, that would go on to, uh, well, the machine that is, would go on to um, be the backbone of a lot of the later work that, that you created, including the next project that came after Cluster 2, which you did with Michael Rotter, right? Mm, Zuckerzeit was the next one, I think. It came oh, out. Harmonia, Harmonia, uh, mu music from Harmonia? Yes, that's what mean? I'm talking about. Did that come after this? I think they come almost to the, at the same Almost same together, time. yeah. Same almost year. together. Well, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about this then, because I think many people uh, who were introduced to your music were introduced through the Harmonia mm -hmm. project. 
So can you explain a little bit about how that came together? Um, uh, after the split of Neu, uh, Michael Rother came to our place and tried to uh, be mem become a member of our group. Of Michael Cluster. Rother, the yeah. guitar player from Neu. Yeah, the guitar player from Neu. Where were you based at this time? And this time we were based in a very beautiful place in the middle of Germany, beside a river which is called uh, Alter Weserhof and Forst. And um, it was a very good... It's the house like of the Middle Age. Utopia. Mm -hmm. You guys bought a house there? We didn't we buy a house. <laughs> we were able to, to live in that house. We had to build it. We had to The government it. gave it to us because it, uh, it's a house that uh, historically protected by government. Uh, you are not allowed to tear it down, but it was just rotten. So we got it to, and we had, uh, we, we had to fix it. And so Michael Rotter comes there and grabs the saw. He came there and he loved the place, of course. And he came he when it already was fixed. <laughs> and he, he, no, he came after it was fixed, is what you're saying. He found the perfect situation. So he liked to, to play with us, and we played once. Uh, we made a concert in, our, in one of, our, of these big houses, and it worked out well. And so we decided to, to make her to found Harmonia beside Cluster. So this was a, a, a group that existed at the same time that Cluster existed. You didn't disband Cluster. You just decided to do collaborative work with Michael Rotor yeah. and call it Harmonia. Yeah. Yeah. And luckily, you were able to get signed by the same label. Yes. And, yes. and put together a record called Music von Harmonia. Yeah. Yeah. And this, uh, as we uh, were talking about earlier, is sort of a bridge record between like this early sound that we were just hearing and the sound for which I would think that you're best known. And there's a track on the album. I don't really know how to say it. Do you say a uh, shawura or wura? How do you say it? Or wura? <laughs> Sorry, man. Oh, <laughs> Hey, man. Like I was saying to these guys earlier, I, I had to apologize 15 times before even starting to speak because I said, I'm going to mispronounce about everything that I say, but my record collector buddy is and I, we look at the back of these German records and we just butcher every name. Not on purpose, of course, you know, it just comes with the territory. Okay, so here's Earworm. Earworm, yes. <laughs> Now that sounds uh, very much like the stuff that came before it, at least in my opinion. Did this song spring from the two of you, or was Michael a big part of that sound as well? Yes, he played. Yeah, but that was sound. more yes. the cluster kind of music. It was more the cluster uh, kind of music, but Michael played an uh, important role in it. This is, this is guitar, this strong guitar sound is from him. Well, from the same album, here is uh, the aptly titled Watusi. Mm-hmm. Music von Harmonia, same album, 1974, Brain. Nice drumming machine.
That, uh, that's mighty progressive for 1974. And I mean that in the best possible way, not in like the kind of wonky rock sort of way. That sounds like as if it could have been made in a studio here by some of these participants. Great song. So whose idea was it to program the drum machine like that? Uh, I don't know which who played the drum machine. Did you play the drum machine, maybe? Could be. Um, it, was, <laughs> it was still the same drum machine, kind of drum machine. And we, this is uh, going out of the drum machine, going in a tremolo. Uh, effect, Trimble effect, effect. Pedal. So it makes the the normal it breaks, rhythm. It, it, breaks. it cuts it in in a different way than the real rhythm goes. So it makes it whole, makes whole it different. Makes it more interesting. <coughs> yeah, it makes it sound like you made a hip hop beat by Jay Dilla in 1974, mm. sort of. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, were you guys? I mean, I know you said you didn't feel the pressure, but were you in any way reacting to the success of Kraftwerk? or the success of the first Neu record in making music like this? Not like this. The next uh, Harmonia album we did, there we definitely tried to be really commercial. <coughs> and I think it, it's really also, in a, in a way, it's our, the most commercial record we ever, we ever did. And then we wanted to go on tour with, with that program. But Achim and myself, we really don't like to repeat the songs on stage that we uh, have on, on, a, on a record. So we would have to rehearse and rehearse and things like that. We don't we hate it, really. And so still now we improvise always. So was all this improvised or was this? This is improvised, but in studio. So. Uh, you, when you have a four track, uh, I think it was a four track we had, so you still can add some things uh, later. But uh, even nowadays in the studio, we first improvise uh, a session and then we work on, a, on, on the song. So on this record in particular, it was just you three doing you. You weren't reacting to anything that was going on around you and trying to make a response in any way. I don't think so. I don't think so. Well, uh, after this record came out, or right around the same time, you did release the cluster album Zuckerzeit. Mm -hmm. And on that album, you quite evenly split the, if you can call it, because it's all improvised, but songwriting duties. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm. Yeah. Each of us did Each six, six songs, yeah. Well, let's play one. Maybe you guys can figure out. Who's behind this one? The first one is no. James. Is it James? <laughs> is that what we call it? Yeah, James. From the Zuckerzeit album, still approximately 1974, right? Mm -hmm. So whose is that? Myself. That's you. Yes. <laughs> well, when I hear it, and the first thing that I remark to you is I, I hear Ethiopian folk music, personally. What did you say, folk music? Ethiopian folk ah, music. Ethi ah, yeah, Ethiopian. Oh, if you think so, you are e half Ethiopian. <laughs> <laughs> mm. But um, you know, I would, I would assume that you were just, again, doing you. Am I right? I mean, were you listening to anything uh, African when you were making this music? Uh, I don't know if it was just at this moment, but uh, usually 
since a long time I listen to as well Indian music and also Afri African music and Arab music as well. Let's uh, play another song from the same album, Hot Lips. Hot Lips, yeah. That must be something of Hakim. He, he's the romantic the ro over here. He's the romantic guy. <laughs> <laughs> Let's check this out from the same album, still approximately 1974. Hot, hot Lips sounds very sexy. So what's the German title? <laughs> Heiße, Lip, Heiße Lippen. <laughs> sounds like something the dentist would do to you. Hot lips. Hot lips. You know, we were talking about this uh, right before we started here, but you estimate that these brain records might have sold, what, 10,000 pieces back then? Hopefully, but uh, I told you that I think perhaps 10,000 with all the, the um, re-releases together. 10,000 total? Yeah. In all I formats? Think so. Yeah, I think. In a period of 20 years or something like that. Well, they are still very uh, obscure records, very hard to find, not as hard to find as the first ones we were listening to, um, but still hard to find records. And this was a short song. We didn't play the entirety of that, but that last song was only a minute and 50 seconds long. And it seems like while you were trying to make pop music or while you were influenced by pop music, making whatever you could make with these first records, by this time you'd figured something out. You'd put your finger on something and you were a little bit ahead of the time. Good. Very good. <laughs> well, the, the issue that comes with that um, is that oftentimes if someone's astute enough to pick up on what a set of innovators like yourselves are doing, he can uh, swoop in and sort of appropriate a certain sound and make it his own just by being the first person to be paying attention to it. I'm referring specifically to Brian Eno, who you met at around the time that you were creating this record. Tell us about that. How did you meet him? Uh, we, we, meet, we met, we him, met in him in Hamburg. No, let's talk together. <laughs> <We're> <laughs> stereo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so we had a, a show in Hamburg, and a harmonia show. Um, and uh, Brian Eno uh, happened to be in town. And he came to the show, and he talked to us in the pause, in the middle of the show, and then he asked us to join us for the second half. And we were thinking, oh, wow, <laughs> <laughs> does this guy have to come on stage with us? Of course, we said, OK, and uh, we played with us, and then he decided to uh, come to visit Cluster in in France some months later, or some years later? No, we invited him to come to our place and to join us for, for a studio, sort of studio session. And he came two years later. Two years, two later, years later, yeah. Later, yeah. So when he first met you, this would be at the end of his tenure with, like you said before earlier, Roxy Music. Yeah. And when he was striking out as a solo artist. He was beginning to make his solo career, yeah met you guys, dug what you were doing, and then sometime later, upon accepting an invitation, joined with you guys in Forced. Mm -hmm. well, this was around the time that you were making the second uh, Harmonia record? No, it was after Harmonia split already. 
So then let's talk about the second Harmonia record because you yeah. went back with Michael Rotor and recorded a second Harmonia yeah. record after yeah. he had, or around the same time, he did yeah. his second yeah. Neue record, right? Well, I don't know about the Neue record, but... Around 76 is when yeah. you did this record again for Brain. Mm -hmm. And uh, you said that this was this album that we're about to play a track from, which was called, um, what was it called? It was Deluxe. Called Deluxe. De Deluxe, yeah. You said this was your attempt at making a commercial record. Yes, the whole project. Even you can see it on the, on the sleeve. It's uh, all very uh, sophisticated and... Um, and we even sang in the record <laughs> all together. First track. You, you say this with uh, a bit of embarrassment almost. <laughs> in a way. <laughs> um, so for the first time, you're going in and, I mean, this is kind of a, a big moment for you guys, trying to make a commercial record. Mm, uh, if it would have been a big commercial success, perhaps I would think different about it. But since it was not, uh, I can, I could say that we, we should not have done it, perhaps even. Well, let's play a track from it. This is Notre Dame. Notre Dame, okay. That's and a nice track. You said earlier that this track has more of a cluster There's influence. more of a cluster feeling, yes. So this is a Harmonia from 1976 from the album Deluxe, but uh, with a bit more of a cluster influence. Nineteen seventy six. And the the band, Harmonia, split up. Yes. Shortly thereafter. Why? Because we because didn't we wanted hated to each rehearse. Other. Wait, what? Because we hated each other. <laughs> 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 Could we it have something to do with the fact that you said uh, yourself earlier you classifies yourself as a, a lazy musician? Uh yes, of course. Because uh I mean lazy, it's because we don't rehearse. We we just uh, we go in the studio and in in ten three days nowadays we finish one whole CD, so we are very fast and we we play with our mistakes. We think the mistakes are really great mistakes, <laughs> so we don't have to repeat. And Michael Rotter didn't take the same approach. Oh no, no. at all, at all. So you guys parted ways. Yeah, we didn't want to rehearse. Uh, and we didn't want to play always the same tracks. Impossible for us. You did manage, however, to record some stuff with Brian Eno around this era, right? We do recorded two records with Brian, and um, he took over one of the beautiful tracks by this river, which is, meanwhile, I think, 100 times covered by, by the whole globe, by people from the whole globe, a beautiful song. He took it over to his first solo record, Before and After Science. Well, one must say that our house on this countryside, where I still live, and Michael Rutter as well, is directly at the riverside. So Brian uh, had the idea of this song when he was in Forst and saw the river flowing by uh, the house. So the text was born in, in Forst when he made the Har Harmonia album, and uh, later on, he used the text when we played together with him as Cluster, as Connie Planck. Yeah, that, you know, that's something that we didn't uh, mention, actually. Throughout all of this, Connie Planck remained your engineer. Yes. Uh, and uh, uh, was he a source of inspiration to you? I mean, he seemed to be an incredible man. He was a very, very good friend. He helped us uh, for a long time to survive. He could live in his house in Hamburg. We had a great time with him in the studio. Even if he, he had to earn his money, of course, and 
with us. Uh, he played oh, now night. I, I remember the group. The group he also produced Ultra Vox. So that was yeah, that quite was, a lot was of some money. Successful yeah. stuff. Mm. Yeah. And around the time of of this record, uh, that's when um, Brian Eno was producing for David Bowie. Yeah. And in many ways, that's how this this music, this music that was originating from Germany, spread out for the first time through but David Bowie. That's, that's what people say nowadays that um, he overtook a big influence of the working working with us and being with us especially i think the main thing was because we, we 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 liked each other a lot so we lived with each other he took brian into the forest to help us to p to pick wo pick up wood and to to go with us to shopping and to cook with us he had my first baby he's taking over care of my first first child and uh, released us from 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 uh, being restless all night, so it was like a family. So I think it's all, all cre clear in the in the atmosphere of our music. But how do you feel about the fact that when the Red Bull guys say, and I think we were talking about this earlier, that they want to get Brian Eno to speak, and he says, "I might have a free day in two years." You know, he might have a free day to come here in two years. Oh yes, yes. yes. You yes, know, yes, we're yes, sitting on yes. the couch together talking about this. I mean, he took a sound in many ways influenced by you and was able to spread it out and become very successful. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that you guys haven't been successful. Of yeah, course, you've been successful in your own right. We only just have some hours more than he has. That's why we are here now. <laughs> <laughs> so there's there's no bad blood between you then. You're 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 very happy for his success. Yes, of course. And you don't feel like your uh, influence has been underappreciated? Oh, at all. Why? Well, because, um, and I'm not saying this from like the, the kind of people that are here, but I'm just saying in the general public's eye, you know, Brian Eno is this great music producer who took a sound and spread it all across the globe, you know, created ambient music or whatever. But we listen to the music that you're creating and we hear these stories about how you're hanging out with them, chopping wood in the forest. You must assume that there was a big amount of influence there. I think we gave. To we me, liked he each said other. once. He said to me, "Don't worry, Moby. You will be rich one day." <laughs> <But> it still <laughs> didn't happen. <laughs> you don't seem to be too upset about it, though. You seem to be very happy. What do you mean? Yeah, well, you know, you don't seem to be upset about the fact that you don't have uh, piles of wealth sitting in a corner somewhere. <laughs> based off of this music. I mean, you seem to be very happy with the music you've created and are still creating. Of course, of course. We just, uh, in this mo very moment, very happy about the very new CD we made that we recorded in the USA. And it's very well working in a way, but it's not enough to get rich, I have to tell Brian. <laughs> <laughs> After this album, you ceased, well, you did one more record for, for Brain, right, after this? Or was this the last record for Brain? This was uh, <coughs> for Brain. Brain. For Brain, I don't know. What did we do for Brain afterwards? I don't know. I think, I don't think so. so I, did some, I did some things with... So Visoso. Uh, so Visoso we did. Uh, I did so some things with Sky? Connie Plank. I did some things. So then you moved on to the Sky label yeah. for the last cluster releases. Yes, yes. And some other other labels, one in USA, Inquisitive Records, and one in uh, Barcelona, Nova Era. <coughs> yeah. But you had disbanded for a while, and you did solo careers in the 80s. Oh yes, fortunately, we hated each other. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine that's possible. <laughs> but you moved to Austria. I had moved to Austria, and but we still met for recordings. We made yeah. a very funny recording. Uh, I think it's it's a Curiosum on a four-track machine on a farm in the north of, of Austria in, uh, I think, in 86 something. And then another mm. one, one hour in... Also in Austria. In Blumau, yes. And when did you reform as Cluster? 90, uh, 2007. And what was the impetus? Why did you do it? Because we laughed each other again. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not going to go renovate another house in the middle of the forest, are you? 
Hmm? You're not going to go renovate another house no, and build no, it from no. scratch and no. collect uh, berries in the forest and all that. <laughs> our, our first concert after the reunion was here in London in the club in the basement somewhere. And how were you received? We just found that uh, it's going to work again. And now it's really going to work again. Well, yeah, I mean, you're making new music and you're realizing that there's entire leagues of musicians that have been influenced by your music across spheres of different genres that you might not even have been aware of until a few years ago. No, That's we right. haven't been aware. Uh, we didn't care anyway because we liked, we are still like, li we like what we are doing, we have fun when we are doing it, and we are not don't listening too much to what people say about what we are doing because we are... We know what we are doing. Meanwhile, do you still listen to any of these old recordings? Do you ever go back and Sometimes. revisit them? Sometimes. Very sad. Sometimes. Now, <laughs> today, <laughs> this <laughs> one. <laughs> I was. I just was astonished to hear one thing that I didn't like. <laughs> Which one? The one of the second harmonia. You didn't like that. No. Although it was me playing the organ. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I could go on and on and 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 try to expound on your influence, but I think that everybody here can probably take it now and ask you questions, and I'm sure there are many, and they're going to come from different fields. <coughs> so I just want to take this time to say thank you for breaking thank all you. this down to us. It's been a great pleasure, and now we're going to open it up to uh, the audience. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, is there a microphone that can be passed around to the audience, or do we want to take one of these? There we go. Here we go. Uh, hello. Um, I've always wondered, because um, uh, I wasn't even born in the 70s, and, and we, we hear a lot about the, the, the 70s scene in, in Germany, and it, people just call it Krautrock. And what I've seen in, in documentaries and interviews is that, um, it, yeah, that there was obviously a, a common, common thing happening uh, with the musicians in Germany, but uh, and the musicians did know each other. But uh, was it um, was it actually a, a scene uh, like uh, like we have today uh, uh, in London, for example, where where people are working together and. And, and trying to make a specific sound, but it, it just seems that in Germany, you were just making pure music, as in, yeah. yeah. So how how do you feel about the Krautrock label? Uh, does it have any meaning at all? Not really to me, because uh, we never were really Krautrockers at all. This harmonia, possibly, it could be labeled Krautrock in a way. But Cluster never did uh, rock, crowd rock, especially not rock. But we are crowds. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, but the, the thing is, uh, even Kraftwerk is, uh, is, has been lab uh, labeled as crowd rock, even though it's not rock music. So, yeah. uh, so okay, well. But I think that you, know, you bring up an interesting point, and it's one that I always thought about when people said can was art rock, and I said, what, what in the hell is art rock? Is yeah. Velvet Underground even is art rock? Even, even Velvet Underground, there's yeah. tracks that can't even be considered rock music, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, but there's, there's, but, and I think this is something that you, we were talking about earlier, too. I mean, you said that you felt that there was a kraut rock scene. It's just that you weren't a part of it. Yes, uh, yes. We were, of course, we were part of it because we knew everybody almost everybody from the scene. But they were always, each city had its own sort of community, music community, and they each be, uh, and all these guys, they concentrated on their own, on, on their own stuff. So there were little collectives yeah, that existed. Co little collectives in Munich, in Düsseldorf, in Köln, in Berlin. There's this so-called the Berlin School of Electronic Music, Klaus Schultz and Tangerine Dream. And there's a Düsseldorf School of Music. This is Kraftwerk and Neu. And I don't know, Amandu, it was, it was more rock than, than uh, all the others. Mostly they, they also uh, had the, the classic arrangement with a drummer, guitar, bass, uh, voice, and voice also. 
and we were really different with our gear. But it wasn't like there was going to be a, a festival of a guy, a bunch of guys coming together from these different scenes and say the Kraut Rock Festival. That was never going to no, happen. No, no, it was no. just something that was understood. There yeah. was a there was a movement going on, and there was who a localized movement as who well. Who invented it anyway? The term? Hmm? Julian Cope. Someone at sides of Germany. Julian Cope, possibly. Yeah. I think it must have been before that, right? I mean, it had to. Nobody have been knows. Yeah. I think it's been used so long that we've just accepted it to, re like you said, refer to a bunch of different sources of music. It's interesting to hear about the scenes, though, because that's, of course, still going on today. Mm -hmm. And then you have people in Los Angeles who will name, name a scene in London, that, or you know, vice versa. Yeah, however, it works. It works, even for us. Um, and just one more thing. Um, and what are your thoughts about your music being sampled by artists all over the world, and, and not just your music, uh, Kraftwerk's music, and, and has been. I mean, uh, the whole crowd rock movement, I guess, has been a huge influence on, on electronic music all around the, the globe, and especially hip-hop music. Uh, and I mean, why do you think that happened with German music and not music from another country? It's great. It brings us money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. So you have made money from being sampled, then? <laughs> Rarely. They have, to, they have to declare, yeah? If they take no, big samples. But... Uh, when you take little samples, uh, you they just do it. What do you think? Yeah, most I do it as well. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, <laughs> aesthetically, do you do you like the idea? <laughs> aesthetically, do you like the idea? I mean, of course, fin there's a financial point. Of course, bond. if it works, if it's really re relevant music, of course it works. It's good. It happened to us since now twice that English group and an American group, I think. They really made a contract with us uh, because they, they used a, a song from us for their record. Um, but that's really uh, an exception, I think. You know, this related question, did you maintain control of your uh, publishing rights and your master recordings? Very good question. I don't have any no. control. You got the publisher, I have about five. And nobody works. Nobody was really doing what you should. But do they own it or do they administer it? They for own you? it. They own it for some time, ah. and um, they just collect the money. If they do something for it, it would be nice. But they, uh, I have the feeling that they don't do anything. They don't uh, approach radio stations. They don't approach theater or TV stations. They just wait whether it brings something or not, and that's a bad thing on it. And these master recordings that were uh, released, of course, by labels like Philips and Brain and Sky, those are all owned by those labels or whoever they sold to, right? No, not. We got uh, this uh, Philips record we got back, so it's re-released by somebody else, by Water Records in uh, San Francisco. And others as well, My m many of my solo works are re-released by different companies. Does the Catholic Church own the first two? The, ca no, ca the, ca the, first, the first two ones, I don't know. No. I don't know you whether they do a contract with uh, God for that? It's a bit <laughs> 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 All right, next question. Hi, uh, I'm Moises from Mexico. And uh, you mentioned uh, when you were recording the, the first Harmonia album that all you guys were living together in a sort of like a utopia. So my, the question is that, do you think that the first movement of it, I mean, the the scene you guys were in single-handedly brought electronic music to, to pop culture? Because before that, it was only in the radiophonic workstations and, and universities. So do you think there was a, a kind of a sense of utopia that was brought into the music? I think so, yes. I mean, f I myself, uh, this place, especially this place where we created the uh, Harmonia and, and Zuckerzeit and Sowieso, so for me it was like utopia, it was beautiful. And um, I had to work like a farmer. We had to go in the forest and to chop wood, what he said, and to garden and to, to repair the house to be able to live in it. So for me it was like, getting back to the roots of civilization in a way. And uh, at the same time, 
I was able to do what I liked most, music. I, every, any minute, as I said, in, in our rural studio, with my Raybox, with an untuned piano, trying to find out what's It's my Raybox. <laughs> you guys really are like brothers. <laughs> and you, yeah. did you feel like it was a, a, a seriously peaceful, great place? Oh, yes, of course. It, 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 you it's can't deny it. It's, it's like he told us. Yeah. It's an exceptional place. still is. It still is. It's also because this is not just a house. It's three houses, uh, in a way. And mm -hmm. these houses, uh, they are from, uh, I think, uh, 1600 or something. Mm. Um, still. So the, it's big walls and big rooms and, mm. and the river and... Just only all nature trees, all around. All trees. <coughs> it's really fantastic. No street, right. no noise, just pure nature. And Hold. a bunch of drum machines. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and do you think uh, uh, recent electronic music, I mean, uh, within any genre, has lost its sense of of that sense of utopia? Do you, like nowadays? Recent. Yeah, recent, recent electronic yes. music. I don't have any time to listen to recent music. I have to do too much. I have to work. I mean, we we sometimes on festivals when we play on festivals, we uh, get in touch and we get to hear um, modern electronic musicians. That sometimes they are on stage with a laptop, and um, some of them are really great. But a lot of them, they just uh, how to say they have their, they have certain programs that they can use and um, I don't know if how to to say I, I I feel that it's not so deep and warm in a way. You know that this is a related question. Like, what would a live cluster show involve? Like, what kind of instruments were on stage? What was the process? At the time or now? No, ba back then. Like back then, or oh, huge, huge equipment, organ, uh, his violin, my cello, guitar, all these twitters, sound generators sound that generator. are normally used by electricians. <laughs> it was heavy stuff. Yeah. We really had to 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 work to bring the stuff on stage. How long would it take for you to set up? Oh, more than an hour, more than an hour. And an hour then we had all these cables that always <laughs> were broken. <laughs> then you had to find out where is <laughs> the fuck, <laughs> and then, then you had to repair it yourself. And oh, come on! <laughs> now it's really much easier for us. And it was just the two of you doing all this setup on stage. You didn't yeah. have any assistance or no. anything. Mm. Oh two yes, we had ten roadmen. <laughs> 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 I was going to say, if you guys are chopping your own wood, you're certainly setting up on stage live. <laughs> Anyone else with questions? Is do you say just last qu last question? Sorry. Um, do, you, do you still work with only analog equipment, or do you incorporate no, laptop no, computers? No, that's a heavy stuff. The analog we equipment. We are happy yeah. that we now can travel with the smallest gear that you can imagine, <laughs> <laughs> and we also use uh, pre pre prepared um, CDs that we always change. Nobody knows what what the hell the other one has now on this evening, so we uh, still uh, improvise even by uh, playing a little bit like a DJ. But we also have synth, but small, and I have chaos pads and uh, sample machine, things like that. Right. Thank you. That's a good thing on it, that we can uh, travel with uh, less heavy weight. Hello, uh, Andrew from Canada. Uh, I was just wondering, you, you guys mentioned that you, uh, you improvise most of your catalog, if not all. Um, I was just wondering uh, if you could uh, attempt to explain kind of uh, how you conceptualize uh, your ideas for songs before improvising them. If there's any kind of, uh, I, I mean, obviously a lot of the music is avant-garde, but does it just happen, or do you have any kind of concept before before? No concept. 
just it happens. Our concept is to have no concept. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. There was no song structure whatsoever. You wouldn't even write out melodies or chord changes or anything like that. We are working for 40 years now. We should know what we are doing, really. <laughs> <laughs> do you? We do, yes, of course. So you write, you write the. We are aware of what we are doing. But you write the songs out now. You write. No, we write the songs on stage. Wow. Still to this very Still, day. Yes, of course. Otherwise, it would make se it would make sense for us. <coughs> yes. <laughs> But now you were talking about like putting the drum machines through tremolo effects so that you could get a different beat out of them so you weren't we always doing a foxtrot. That was improvised too? Uh, of course it's in a way improvised because you have the idea to do that and then next time perhaps you don't do it anymore or next time you don't put push the button foxtrot <laughs> but the other one. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, that's all kind of improvisation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Anything else? Welcome. Um, uh, in in recent years, or for a while now, there's been a lot of artists who are, are big in the '70s who have kind of come back and started playing again and, and, and oftentimes kind of playing all their hits. And I think all the, uh, us as, as, as young people, we're, we're constantly exposed to, to music of the past, which is, you know, great music and, and for obvious reasons. Um, and you guys have come back, and, but you're not doing that. You're playing completely new music. What do you think about the kind of, uh, kind of canonization of, 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 of artists from the past? Um, and, and how do you think that as young people now creating music, we should take those influences but also create new music and, and not get too tied down in that? You shouldn't get uh, too much fixed to the history of music. You should really try to do it from your stomach and from your heart, not from your head. I think listening to the richness of sound and nature is something you should be aware, you should be aware of. and to select what you really want to do, to find your own tone language. I think that's the most important thing. Not listening too much to others because then you get mixed up because it's so easy to do, to work e also with uh, all this modern technology. It's so easy to do something, but um, you never know whether it's your music or it's a machine. Thank you. But you know that's a that you bring up an interesting point, and you know you guys are, I mean you're what in your forties? You're in your forties now? Just kidding. Yes. <laughs> I mean you're you're seventy five years old, and you're sixty five, and and I found this more in let's just say music than in film or something like that. But like a musician who made his name for the at first in the seventies comes back in the two thousands and says I'm going to get on stage and I'm going to perform at festivals with contemporary artists. Many times I've found, at least on, on my side of the fence, that the first thing they do is listen to what's new and try to approximate that. And in doing so, the only way that you can enjoy them is by picturing you know, this canonization, this ideal you had of them a long time ago because they're not doing anything like it now. They're just <laughs> reacting to something. Whereas it seems that you guys never reacted. Well, I mean, maybe once or twice. Yes. Not really. Of course, we are, we are part of it. We are part of the society. But you're not like you know going on iTunes and downloading the top ten on the electronic music chart or whatever, and trying to figure out how you can make music that I mimics mean, that. Mm, no, and as a result, that's why you're still here. And we talk to people all over that say, you know, clusters back. I was talking to a producer from the BBC the other day, buying some records from him, and he, I, I remarked that I was going to be uh, talking with you, and he said, yeah, I heard cluster was back. And you know that in and of itself was a very nice thing to say, I thought, because it wasn't qualified with anything. It wasn't like they're back and they're not doing anything that sounds as good as what they did. Of course, it's going to be different. It was just you were back. We are there still. <laughs> Better put. We are privileged. <laughs> we can do what we want to do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you ever had a problem with doing what you wanted to do. <laughs> Somehow you've been able to <laughs> flop through a record after record after record of everything you wanted to do, execs be damned. Good for you, both. Also, we have 
our solo career, we, could, we were able to do what you really like to. That's the other part of it. So the other part can't fuck your music up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You guys need to have a, a sitcom. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the Odd Couple, part two. <laughs> any other questions? Are there any other here? Um, your last Thank chance. you. Thank you for coming. Yes, thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. Cluster, ladies and gentlemen.